So, Yahweh, we praise you. Alleluia. Um, praise you, Lord God, for you have revealed yourself to us, and you are good. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to believe it, to preach it, to hear it. Uh, of course, we say it in Jesus' name. Yahweh is salvation. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Lord, for making us mammals, right? Warm-blooded, not reptiles. Listen, if you need a coat, I'm serious, there's a couple down here, and you can just come up and grab one and put it on, okay? Um, but anyway, um, it's great to see you. Seventy-three years ago, the world was suffering the greatest war in history. My dad fought in that war, and I love to hear him tell the stories about uh, World War II. On the night of June 5th, 1944, no one knew if the world would fall into the hands of the Japanese, Japanese Empire or, or Adolf Hitler's Third Reich or, or whether the people of this world would eventually breathe the air in freedom. Everything depended on the success or failure of an imminent invasion. The Germans knew it, the Allies knew it, the world knew it, Dwight D. Eisenhower, supreme commander of Allied forces, he knew it. He was to make the call. Based on the tides, the phases of the moon, the weather reports over the channel, he had chosen the morning of June 5th. But at the last minute, due to the weather, he postponed the invasion till the morning of June 6th, when, when at 1.30 a.m., paratroopers began dropping behind enemy lines. It was D-Day. At 6.30 a.m., thousands of American, Canadian, British, and French boys and young men began invading the beaches of Normandy. 10,000 lost their lives that day. And by the evening of the 6th, Eisenhower would know whether it had all been in vain or whether the world would now breathe the free air, saved. I wonder how Eisenhower spent the night of the 5th, waiting, watching, doubting. I would imagine suffering passions that he had never anticipated. I wonder if he sweat blood Hematohydrosis, the medical term, is said to happen to people under intense stress. I wonder if he prayed in a garden. Imagine if he called you, said your name, and asked you, um, would you just come over and sit with me? Wait with me, watch with me. Would you sympathize? Would you have pathos with me, compassion? Would you just feel this with me? Because I feel so incredibly alone. If that happened and Dwight D. Eisenhower called you on June 5th, would you consider that an honor? Or maybe a gift? And if you were Dwight D. Eisenhower, whom would you call? Well, I'd call Susan, my bride. Or maybe one of my kids. Or a few of my best friends. Jesus called Peter. Angels longed to look. Legions stood ready. And he called on Peter, James, and John his old friends with whom he used to go fishing. It was late Thursday night 2,000 years ago in the Garden of Gethsemane, which means olive press. You know, Jesus is the Christ, which means the anointed with oil. So doubtless he was praying under a tree, an olive tree, just a few hours earlier, he had said to them, this is my body given to you, and then he had placed broken bread on the table. And in the same manner, he took a cup and said, this is the covenant in my blood, drink of it, all of you. And then he placed the cup on the table next to the bread. 
In a few hours, he would be flogged, nailed to a tree, and descend into Hades. The very depths of space and time, the very depths of every evil decision ever made by the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Your pain, your sorrow, your isolation and confusion. His, his mission was to subject all creation to the Father such that all creation would freely bend the knee, gladly praising the Creator and born into the fullness of, of life. No words can describe the pathos that he must have felt as he prayed these words. Father, if it be possible, for nothing is impossible for you. Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He made a choice to freely will what he did not will on our behalf. He's the free will of God given to each one of us at a cost to himself that none of us can fathom. He is our righteousness. Just before he made that choice, praying that prayer, sweating great drops of blood, falling to his knees under the tree, he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, my soul is filled with sorrow, even unto death. Peter, would you stay awake with me? Would you watch, would you wait, would you watch with me? And Peter, pray that you don't enter into temptation. Three times Jesus asked this of Peter. And three times Peter fell asleep. According to Luke, he slept for sorrow. And then three times before dawn, Peter denied Jesus saying, I never knew the man. And he hid in darkness. We ask God, where are you when we suffer? Maybe we should ask, where are we? Where am I when God suffers? We don't know where Peter was. But, but we do know that when Jesus rose and found Peter, he asked him three times, do you love me? And we do know that Peter, with the help of Silvanus or Silas, wrote these words about 35 years later. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial, the porosis when it comes upon you, to test you or to tempt you as though something strange, same words, surprising were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Beloved, let us not BS one another right now, for we are all surprised at the porosis, the fiery trial when it comes upon us, aren't we? We all think, what did I do wrong? But Peter seems to think it's really about God doing something right, and that surprises us. Just five verses earlier, Peter, Peter wrote this. The end of all things is at hand. Wake up and get sober. He sounds like Jesus, you know, when he came preaching, repent, get a new brain. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so our last message was titled, Repent, the kingdom is the van. We've been talking, making the point that the kingdom is at hand in the van. So, the, so Peter is saying the kingdom is at hand. Don't be surprised at the burning. That's surprising. It must have been surprising for Peter. I mean, remember Peter had recently ascended the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, and there he saw Jesus transfigured, shining like the sun in a cloud of glory, and talking to Elijah, who had gone up to heaven in a fiery chariot, but even more amazing, Moses, who had descended into Sheol in the wilderness, descended into death. In that moment, God had made all things new. And the kingdom was right there at hand. But before Peter knew it, Jesus was praying this crazy prayer in a garden. Luke 9.32, Peter was heavy with sleep on the mountain. It was just too much glory 
And then he couldn't stay awake in Gethsemane. It was too much sorrow. Jesus had said, pray that you do not enter in temptation. Well, what was the temptation? Uh, John talked about this. I think I'm saying the, the same thing. The temptation must have been to fall asleep and dream that he was in control. Because that's what a dream is. That he was his own creator, savior, and redeemer. When he woke up, he took a sword and tried to save the savior of the world. Remember that? You remember what the savior of the world had to do? He had to reattach the guy's ear. Beloved, do not be surprised, I think Peter was surprised, at the porosis. You want to hear something really surprising? The word porosis only shows up two other times in the Bible, in the New Testament, both in reference to the great whore of Babylon in the Revelation. The kings of the earth weep over the smoke of her porosis, for they all did business with the great whore. And what does she do? She attempts to buy and sell love. In the Revelation, she's Jerusalem, but then in her place, a bride descends who's the new Jerusalem. We preached all about, about all of this, remember, a few years ago. I think Peter, John, Paul, Hosea, and Jesus think that we're all the great whore who become the bride after the burning. That's surprising. Beloved, do not be surprised at the process coming on y'all to test you. We think life is a test so that God can find out what we're going to do. But life is a test so that we can find out what God has done and is always doing and will always do. Life is a test so we can know that God is love and then freely surrender to that love. Peter told us this in chapter 1. You have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor in the revelation of Jesus. Your faith is tested like gold is tested by fire, pyrosis, pyromania, pyrosis. And although gold perishes, faith does not. And perhaps that's because it's not simply our faith. It's not simply your faith. In the words of Peter, it's the word of God. It's the gospel that was preached to you. It's the imperishable seed. You know, our father didn't tempt Adam But you go back and read this story. I think he did lead Adam into temptation in the garden that he might take the life of the good on the tree and see that God gives the life of the good on the tree. Jesus is the good and the life on the tree. And so, of course, Jesus prays uh, and says, pray, lead us not into temptation. Our temptation is to do that, to test God. Sin is taking the life of Christ on the tree. And it is the greatest sorrow. Grace is the life of Christ given on the tree. And it is the greatest joy. Sin is temporal. Grace is eternal. So I think Jesus is saying, stop taking my love like a whore. And I will give you my love like a bride. For you are my bride and I am your groom. Trust me. Have faith. Faith is born at the foot of a cross after a great test, trial, and temptation, which our bridegroom passes and never fails, although it hurts like hell, for there he bears all the sin and sorrow of this fallen world. In other words, our unfaithfulness. And you see, Peter, like all the prophets and apostles, seems to think that this is all according to plan. And that's surprising. That surprises us. 
I think it surprises the translators who repeatedly seem to think that we save ourselves from God with our faith. When Peter, like Paul, teaches that God saves us from ourselves with his faith, his faithfulness given uh, to us. So in the scripture slides, I usually include the more literal translation in brackets, not because the English Standard Version is necessarily wrong, but I do think they're trying to make the words fit into the wrong story, the wrong picture or paradigm, the story of Mises rather than the story of Jesus. Verse 12, don't be surprised, but rejoice insofar as you koinonia, commune in, fellowship in, share in Christ's sufferings, pathema from pathos, that's passion, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. That's, you see, so strange, so surprising to modern American particularly evangelical ears, because we keep thinking that Jesus suffered, so we don't have to. And Peter, Paul, and Jesus keep talking as if he suffered so that we would suffer with him, becoming like him in his death, writes Paul, so that if possible, we may become like him in his resurrection, as if Jesus actually meant what he said when he said, pick up your cross and come follow me. And people kind of knew what crosses did back then. One of the last things Jesus says to Peter, just after he asked him three times, do you love me, is this. Peter, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this is the crazy thing. Peter seems to want to go there now when he's old. Rejoice insofar, writes Peter. Rejoice. How much? How far? Insofar as you walked on water with Jesus. Nope. That's what we said. Insofar as you ascended the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Nope. Insofar as you raised the dead. You know, Tabitha, Acts chapter 9. That was so cool. Insofar as, as that you did with Jesus. Nope. Insofar as you suffer with Jesus. Verse 13. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad. Agaliao means much leaping, totally freak out, when his glory is revealed, literally in the revelation of his glory. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ. What's the name of Christ? It's not Christ. That's a title. It means the anointed, like we said. His name is Jesus. Why would you be insulted for saying the, the name of Jesus? Anybody can say Jesus. Walk down the street and just say it. See what happens. Not much. People are fine with the name Jesus as long as you don't explain what it means. I've discovered this. <laughs> Jesus, or in the Hebrew, the Old Testament, Joshua or Yahashua in Hebrew, Yeshua in Aramaic, means Yahweh Yasha. Yahweh, dad, is salvation. Or Yahweh saves, period. And you see, if God is salvation, that means that you are not salvation. And if Yahweh is the salvation of everybody that's anybody, then nobody saves themselves or is saved by anybody other than Yahweh. So Jesus is the death of Mises and Weezes, which is your ego and our collective ego, which goes by names like the Evangelical Church, or Jerusalem, or Rome, or the United States of America. If Jesus is the Savior, because people often ask, Peter, why are people getting so angry? But listen closely. If Jesus is the Savior of everyone that's anyone, that means that you are not worse than anyone. And you are not better than anyone. And yet you are absolutely different 
from everyone. You're unique. And that, by the way, is exactly what I was always trying to tell the kids in the van. And that is exactly what the principalities and powers of this world do not want you to tell anyone, for it is entirely disruptive to the powers that be to proclaim that, well, servants are just as valuable as masters. And women are just as valuable as, as men. Ugh. And sinners, just as valuable as saints. And Venezuelans, just as valuable as Americans. And yet at the very same time, to still proclaim that none are exactly alike and each one of us is uniquely and wonderfully different. There is nothing more offensive to your ego and the principles and powers of this world than the grace of our all-powerful, all-knowing, and eternal dad. In other words, it will offend the hell out of you to get in his van. Verse 14, if you're insulted, if you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Makar oil, literally, blessed are you. See, Peter, it's like Peter actually believes the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, happy are you when men revile you and persecute you, blah, blah, blah. Because the spirit of God, he says, because the spirit of the glory and of the God rests upon you. The spirit of God rested. The first Adam became a living soul, psyche. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. What spirit does the eschatos Adam, the last Adam, give you? He gives you the spirit of God our Father. The spirit of relentless love. He is relentless love. And, and where does he give it to you? On a tree? In a garden? <sighs> In Junction City. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Whew. You know, like Moses. Or David. Or Paul. Or us. Who take the life of Christ on the tree. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief. You know, like, like Jacob. Who stole the blessing and the birthright of the firstborn. Or us, who tried to steal the birthright and blessing of the firstborn of all creation. Or an evildoer, which is exactly what the first Adam does. Or a meddler, I love this, in Greek that's a busybody. Someone that likes to judge others because they haven't come to terms with their own judgment. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. You know, Christ is the anointed. Somehow we're also the anointed Christians. Well, do you think St. Paul, the murderer, suffered as a Christian when he thought of all those Christians that he had persecuted and even murdered? I'm sure he did. And yet everything now had a new meaning because Christ had appeared to him and judged the hell out of him on the road to Damascus. Did David suffer as a Christian when he confessed his sins, you know, against Uriah and Bathsheba? Did, did he suffer as a Christian when he confessed his sins and then wrote the psalm saying, you have turned my mourning into dancing? He doesn't say you replaced my mourning with dancing. He says you turned my mourning into Dancing, you have turned my sin into the Psalms. Did Moses suffer as a Christian on the Mount of Transfiguration? You know, suffering, pathema or pathos, is also translated passion and means something like emotion. So both sorrow and joy are emotions. It's something from beyond you overwhelming you. On the mountain, Moses must have known that even his murder of the Egyptian had been transformed into gospel and endless joy for all Egyptians. Did Jacob suffer as a Christian when he wrestled the firstborn of all creation at the river Jabbok at the edge of the promised land? I think he did. For in the promised land, he hugged his brother Esau and everything old became like new, including his name, Israel. God wrestler. Verse 16, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name, for it is time for judgment to begin. That's surprising. We thought judgment came, you know, at the end of time or something like that. 
Peter wrote this like 2,000 years ago. It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. That's surprising. For many say Jesus was judged, so we, his household, would not be judged. Next verse. And if it begins with us, writes Peter, what will be the outcome, the telos, the end, for those who do not obey, apatheo, refuse to believe the gospel, the good news of God? What will be their end? Is Peter suggesting two ends? No. He just told us the end is at hand. There's one end who is beginning, the beginning and the way, and yet, you know, the righteous experience him in a very different way from the unrighteous. He burned the hell out of Paul. He wrestled the hell out of Jacob in order to wrestle the heaven into both of them. That is his righteousness into both of them. What should be the punishment for those who refuse to believe the gospel? That they would never, ever, ever, ever believe the gospel? Should that be their punishment? What should be the punishment for not loving the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself? That you should never, ever, 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 without end, love the Lord your God or your neighbor as yourself? What should be the punishment for not mowing the lawn, Coleman? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not that you can never, ever, ever, will never, ever, should never, won't ever, ever mow the lawn again. It's that your life is going to get unmanageable until you do. The Lord said to Paul, it's hard to kick against the goads, Paul. The goads will win. I said to my kids, we're all going to the magic kingdom, so get in the van. And I think they understood this. It's going to get worse here in Junction City until you do. You know, I never, ever, ever disciplined my neighbor's kids. I only disciplined those in my household. Because they were the ones that I loved. And still do. Verse 18. And if the righteous is scarcely, molus, with difficulty, saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? That's a good question. Whatever it did become of the chief of sinners? His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was saved with some difficulty. <laughs> Peter was saved with some difficulty. That's for sure. But I'm thinking that Judas was saved with even more difficulty. Jesus called him friend and descended into Hades to preach the gospel to the dead in order that judge in the flesh the way men are. Judas might live in the spirit the way God does. That's what Peter just told us in verse 6. And Peter just wrote, if the righteous is saved with difficulty, where will the ungodly and the sinner phanetai, literally shine? And we all with unveiled faces are beholding the glory of God, are being changed, we're being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another, wrote Paul. And then he also wrote this, whatever, exposed to, whatever is exposed by the light becomes visible. And once visible, it itself is, is light. He's saying, we're going to shine like Moses. But not when he came down from Mount Sinai, we're going to shine like Moses as he stood on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer. Now just stop. Who here suffers? Go ahead, raise your hands. Okay, now everybody... Look around. Keep them up. Look around. Look at everybody else in the van. I mean, the church. The snake is telling you that you suffer because God does not love you. And the Word is telling you that you suffer because God will not stop 
loving you. Verse 19, let those who suffer according to God's will. If you're worried that you're not suffering according to God's will, then just give your sufferings to Jesus. And you are. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. According to God's will, for he is God's will, he is salvation, and we are growing up into him, into salvation. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust, peritithemai, it means to place before like food on a table, their souls, their, their psyches, uh, entrust their psyches to a faithful creator while doing good. And what is the good? Faith. And what is the bad? Faithlessness. And what is Jesus? The faithful one. And trust your psyches to a faithful creator. That's surprising. Why? Well, because we all think that we've already been created. And now I need to remind you just how Bass Ackwards, we modern Western Christians seem to have gotten this gospel thing. I mean, we, we think it goes like, like this, that in the beginning, God creates everything, right? And everything is good, except for that, you know, we mess it up and God can't fix it because our judgment is stronger than his judgment. That's why he didn't stop the whole mess up thing in the garden, because he just didn't see it coming. And then God does this whole Jesus thing. And if we choose Jesus, then God chooses to save us. But we won't really know until the end, until judgment day, the end of the ages, when God judges our judgment, our judgment, our choice, which determines whether or not he's going to have to torture us forever without end or bless us forever without end. But you understand how it goes, right? Creation, salvation, judgment. But Peter is talking as if the end is the beginning, and so it goes judgment, salvation, creation. He's talking as if in the beginning, God issued a judgment. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. But in the beginning, on the sixth day, Adam is not entirely a good. He, he's, he's alone in the presence of God who is love. He doesn't have faith in love. And so God does the whole Jesus thing. He consigns all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. In other words, that he may have Jesus on all. And then comes the finished creatum, creation, Adam in the image and likeness of God. Why? Well, because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And who is he? The faithful one. You see, once I meet the end, I discover that the end is the beginning and the way, and it's all the revelation of love. It's all the tree in the middle of the garden. And this is why I keep telling you the story of my family's journey to Disney World, the Magic Kingdom, and why, if you're new right now, you may be a little bit confused and lost, because this is the fourth message where I've been telling this one story. Thirty-five and a half years ago, I made a judgment. I decided to drive my kids to Disney World, but I didn't want to tell them too early because I knew they couldn't bear the pain of, you know, waiting that long. It was just too much to hope. So when they pressed, I told them that we were going to Junction City, Kansas, which was the truth, just not more truth than they could bear at the time. In Junction City, Susan and I surprised them with the revelation, we're going to the Magic Kingdom. But instead of dancing with joy, they complained and said, I don't want to get back in the van. Why? Well, because they had set their hopes on the park and the bowling alley in Junction City. But I saved them from Junction City because I said, just get in the van. And they surrendered their sorrow and got in the van. That's called faith. 
their faith and hope grew in the van <laughs> until once we arrived in the magic kingdom, they couldn't stop jumping with joy over and over. They'd say, I can't believe I wanted to stay in Junction City, Daddy. I love you. And the magic kingdom was that much more magic because of our time in the van. Faith and hope in love grew in the van. Now, it's not a perfect story, but hopefully you see how it goes. Judgment, salvation, creation. And that's the way it goes in the family of any good father. The father issues the judgment, which is the salvation and the creation. I'm going to the magic kingdom, and I'm taking you all with me. But we can't arrive until all of us arrive because y'all are my magic kingdom. And I am yours. And on the journey, the father's judgment becomes the judgment of his children. If I could make my story more biblical, <clears throat> the children would not have gotten in the van so easily in Junction City. But you see, they had already encountered this situation several times before in different ways, and so grudgingly they, they got in the van. But if I could make my story more biblically, I would have the children steal the van. <laughs> which, which is the way. And then they would crash the van thinking that they had killed me, but I would haunt them. I would like romance them in their sorrows, nurturing their deepest longings as I spied on them, weeping in the park. And then I'd rise from the dead, I'd repair the van, and I'd say, I've always loved you and forgiven you, and, and now are you finally ready to get in the van? That's what happened at the cross, isn't it? We tried to steal the way and we crash the van. And our father was in the van. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, writes Paul. And so you see, we got that bass backwards as well. In just the last couple hundred years, we came up with the modern penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. It's the way we've explained it is basically the idea that our Father in heaven got so mad at us, he took his anger out on the van. He killed Jesus so he wouldn't have to kill us. But it's, it's just unbiblical. And I could tell you, I try to tell you the reasons why all the time. It's unbiblical, illogical, and absurd because it leaves us stuck in Junction City without a van. And a father who is not love, and not one, but seriously divided and mentally ill, just like us. The van is the way, and our father is driving it. Jesus is the van, and we're saved in him. And yet, you still feel sorrow, don't you? Recently, a good friend said to me, Peter, how can you feel sad when you preach and believe the things that you preach? Well, sorrow, I think, I've thought about this so much, is the distance between your current experience and your best imagination of the magic kingdom. We're all suffering this sorrow. But the greater your knowledge of the magic kingdom, the more deeply you will be aware of this sorrow. If you bury this sorrow, refuse to face this sorrow, <clears throat> If you try to mitigate this sorrow with your own knowledge of good and evil and your willpower, it's called sin. And you will sink deeper and deeper into addiction. 
longing for the wine of the kingdom, you'll get hooked on a bottle. Longing for communion, you'll become a whore or a pimp, <laughs> whatever. You'll sink deeper into addiction, isolation, despair, and death. But if you surrender this sorrow and suffer it with Jesus, it goes by another name. And that name is hope. And hope will not disappoint you, writes Paul. Just before they left the supper and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus talked the guys of, to the guys about giving birth as if they were pregnant with imperishable seed. And then he said to them, you will be sorrowful. <clears throat> and your sorrow will turn into joy. Not it will be replaced by joy. It will be turned into joy. And then he said, in this world you will have tribulation." He did not say you will be raptured out of tri tribulation while all the losers suffer tribulation. He said, you will have tribulation, but take heart, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, the age. You will have sorrow, but you must suffer that sorrow with Jesus. You must get in the band. You must meet him in the Garden of Gethsemane. After I returned from my mountaintop experience in Canada all those years ago, you know, I was hoping that I could just like repeat it and give it to anybody whenever they, they wanted. And maybe that happened for some, I don't know. But when I returned, I think he led me into the wilderness <clears throat> where I encountered evil like I had never before even thought possible. Praying for a few friends, I saw things that filled me with unspeakable sorrows, and yet repeatedly Jesus would appear in visions of the past that were verified to my scientific brain, and he would turn all that sorrow into revelations of his glory, which began to fill me with such hope. And I began to pray, dear God, why can't you do this for everyone? And I think he began to answer my prayer by saying, yeah, Peter, you go and find the Bible verse that tells me I can't, and I got to say that I still haven't found that Bible verse. But I found thousands that say he can and he will. <clears throat> and yet, I have tasted such sorrow. Sorrow reveals that the thing we call this world or this age is not the magic kingdom. It's something more like a bad dream that has become a nightmare. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Puddlegum, the Marsh Wiggle, in case you remember, is seduced by uh, the evil witch into thinking that there is no Narnia. There is no, uh, there is only the underworld. That is, there's only Junction City. That's all that there is. And to break the spell and to wake from the dream, Puddlegum plunges his foot into a fire. And C.S. Lewis writes, there is nothing like a good shock of pain for dissolving certain kinds of magic. Pain reminds you that you are not salvation. And you need salvation. Pain reminds you that Mises is, well, kind of an illusion. And Jesus is your only hope. Pain reminds you to get in the van. And Jesus is the van. Sorrow, unsurrendered, Sorrow that's not surrendered is choosing to live in the matrix. It's surrendering to the lies of the evil, and it's pretending that you can drive the van. But sorrow that is surrendered is getting in the van. Jesus is the van. Surrendered sorrow is hope. So this was the cover that I used for this sermon um, the three sermons ago. And this is the cover for the sermon uh, two sermons ago. Sorrow exposes hearts when the sorrow is surrendered. That means you don't expect someone to fix it. You just allow them to see it. People who manipulate with sorrow haven't surrendered their sorrow. Jesus was not manipulating Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
He didn't expect Peter to fix it. Sorrow exposes hearts, especially the father's heart. In Junction City, I think in a small way, my children saw my heart. They saw that it hurt me, that it hurt them, but only because I was in something so much better for them than the bowling alley. Do you understand what it is that's hanging on the tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden? The Garden on Calvary? And the Garden in the New Jerusalem? It's the heart of your father. In the words of John, Jesus from the bosom of the father. He has made him known. Jesus is the end, the beginning, and the way. Jesus is in the van. You know, nothing will suddenly unify a body quite like pain, right? Stub your toe and everything moves. And nothing will unify hearts quite like surrendered sorrow. Surrendered sorrow is a revelation of self in the form of confession. Surrendered sorrow is a revelation of others in the form of compassion. Surrendered sorrow is a revelation of Christ in the form of mercy, the revelation that we took his life and he gave his life. We drew his blood and he already had given his blood and still gives his blood. Surrendered sorrow is a revelation of God that he is an endless communion of sacrificial love. In the van, my kids had to tolerate each other. Suffer each other. Forgive each other. And then discover that the kingdom is each other. I titled the last sermon, The Kingdom is uh, the Van. And I made this cover up here on the screen. But Glenn and I both thought it would probably freak people out, you know. And so we used the other picture for the cover. But this is what I was saying. The kingdom at hand is a van full of body parts. Why? Because that's exactly what we are. It's what any church is, the body of the body of, of Christ. We are a body parts that must be joined at the wounds, which means we'll each have to tolerate each other, suffer each other, uh, forgive each other, which is the revelation of each other, actually. And all of that is a whole lot of surrendered sorrow. And yet a body in which each sacrifice is for all and all sacrifice for each may have a memory of pain, but it only feels pleasure. It may have knowledge of evil, but it only knows the good, which is life, which is constantly chosen in the perfect freedom called love. And so this is the cover for, for this week. The Lord said, your mourning will turn into dancing and your sorrow will turn into joy. I think that means your knowledge of evil will turn into your knowledge of the good because I am the good. And I am the life. And I stopped in Junction City so that you would know me as I already know you because I am your magic kingdom and you are my magic kingdom. Just after Jesus said the thing about sorrow turning into joy, and just before he asked Peter to watch with him, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus lifted his head and he prayed this. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you had sent, the van, that you would know me, dad in the van. <laughs> Know me. An old Hasidic rabbi, Levi Itzak of Ukraine, used to say that he discovered the meaning of love from a drunken peasant. Entering a tavern, he saw these two peasants, both gloriously in their cups. Each had been protesting how much he loved the other one. Do you love me? You know I love you. Whoa, do you? You know I do. Each was proclaiming how much they loved the other. When Ivan said to Peter, Peter, tell me what hurts me. Bleary-eyed Peter looked at Ivan and he said, how would I know what hurts you? And Peter's answer was quick. If you don't know what hurts me, how can you say you love me? As you know, shortly after this letter was written, Peter was fleeing persecution in Rome. When he had a vision of Jesus going the other direction and carrying a cross, he said, my Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified once and again. 
And at that, Peter turned, ran back into the city, and was crucified with Christ. Jesus had said, Peter, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another, I wonder who the other was, another will carry you where you do not want to go. And this is the miracle. Although it wasn't where he had wanted to go, it was where he now willed to go because he wanted to. <laughs> ah. See, it was as if he was praying in a garden with Jesus, saying, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. And it wasn't suicide. It was just the opposite of suicide. It wasn't sadism. It wasn't masochism. It was love. One day you'll see Jesus and Peter drinking the wine of the kingdom and both gloriously in their cups. And Jesus will say, Peter, do you love me? And Peter will say, you know I love you. And Jesus will say, well, tell me what hurts me. And Peter will hold up his hands and those brilliant wounds and say, Saving all of us hurts you. And Jesus will smile and say, yep, and totally worth it. And then Jesus will say your name. Tell me what hurts me. And you'll say something like, suffering my divorce hurt you. Man, getting picked on, on third grade on the bus, that hurt you. And when I abused others, it hurt you. And it hurt me when I saw that it hurt you. And then he'll say, thank you, my love, for watching and waiting with me. And now I think this may be the greatest wonder of all. He will point to some old wounds on your body, and they will match some of, not all, but some of the old wounds on his. His eyes will sparkle. He will smile, and he will say, you know me, and I know you, and we love each other, don't we? Those scars are eternal. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So before they were yours, I think they belonged to him. And so it's not simply that he shares in your suffering. Peter writes, oh, rejoice. Rejoice insofar as you share in his. And so on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Place it on the table and said, take and eat. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. And they were all sitting there. <laughs> then he put it there on the table. So if you would, just close your eyes for a minute. And besides shaking with cold, just ask the Lord, what is my sorrow? <laughs> do, do that, okay? Just say, Jesus, what is my sorrow? <laughs> and now I, what I want you to do, what I think he wants you to do, is bring your wounds, bring your sins, bring your sorrow. Place them on the table. In other words, suffer them with him, for he has always suffered them with you. In other words, lose your psyche and find it in his psyche. Let him turn your sorrow into joy.
my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. And do you remember what we said sin was? Not surrendering your sorrow, holding it to yourself, trying to fix the problem yourself. But where's my sin? Well, it's back at this tree. And who's on the tree? Jesus. And so in my sorrows, I am not alone. They are ours. And uh, he doesn't stay sad. He takes us on a journey. And then suddenly, even in this moment, I'm not sad. <laughs> I'm like, we can do this. <laughs> you can do this. We can do this. I'm your body. <laughs> the body of Christ. And, now let me say, if you're saying, well, how can I hurry up the process? <laughs> well, you can hurry up the process by um, connecting with some other people here in the van. And, and now I really mean this. I, I kind of think the church drop, has dropped the ball in a large part in the 21st century. And groups like Alcoholics Anonymous have picked it up, not even maybe knowing it. Because what happens in one of those groups? Well, we have, an all, we have an accepted sin, so to speak. And I think all sin is a form of addiction. And people sit in a circle, and what do they do? They expose their hearts one to another. They can't fix each other's hearts. They just expose them. And then what happens when they expose those hearts one to another? They begin to connect at the point of the wound. And then... Uh, I have to think of my pictures. Then after they connect at the point of the wound, they begin a journey, right? And discovering that they're no longer alone, suddenly they're no longer addicted in the way that they used to be addicted. And what was the problem with Adam in the garden on the sixth day of creation before the fall? He was alone, and he didn't even know it. But you're not alone. So um, go into the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And then, and this is the frustrating part. There's, there's not like a program, there are small groups, whatever. Just find somebody and surrender your sorrow to them and let them surrender their sorrow to you and let God um, raise you from the dead. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. And let me just say this real quick too. Stay standing. But uh, online, we put the sermon transcripts up in a week. And for this sermon, I had just like pages of footnotes of really cool quotes from all kinds of people. So if you think I just made all this stuff up, I didn't. You can read about the stories and stuff in the footnotes. And then I also want to say, if, you, if you'd like to pray with somebody, uh, Ted would be a great guy to play with, or you can grab John or me or whoever. And that's really what prayer is, right? It's like that we are to be each other's priest. That the priest doesn't fix it. He just listens to the confession, to the sorrow. Um, okay, so believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.